CHM 507 Industrial Chemistry Chapter 3 Material Balance. In this lesson I'm going to take you through solutions to some of the material balance problems in Chapter 3. And we'll start with question number 5. So drinking water is produced by partially freezing salt water to create salt-free ice and a brine solution. So the drinking water would be the salt-free ice. If salt water is 3.5 percent by weight salt and the brine solution is 9 percent by weight salt, determine how many kilograms of salt water must be produced to produce 2 kilograms of ice. So this is a, a problem that's solved by mass balance. We start by drawing a diagram of the system. So here I've drawn a processing unit, which in this case is a freezer, and the mass going in is the seawater, and what's coming out is ice and a brine. Next you'll want to record the particulars that apply to each stream. So we're told that the seawater is 3.5% salt and the balance therefore must be water and that would be 96.5% water. The ice is, well it's just water, it's 100% water and the brine we're told is 9% by weight salt and that means that the other 91% must be water. So our basic mass balance equation is that mass in equals mass out. You can write it either way, mass out equals mass in, whichever seems more easy to write equations for. In this case, the mass in is the seawater going in. The mass out would be the brine plus the ice. So at this point, I want to refer back to how to solve simultaneous equations. Let's look at something familiar. They're generally in the form, like shown here, 2x minus y is 12 x plus y is 3. We have two linear equations with two variables. The constants are on the right and then we have of course the unknowns or variables with their coefficients in front of them. They would have then the general form a1x plus b1y is a constant. a1 and b1 are coefficients of this variable x and y. And similarly a2x plus b2y is a second constant. Now I prefer to use letters for constants that help me remember just what stream I'm talking about. So instead of calling it X, I'll call it S for seawater and B for brine and I would be for ice, but in this case our ice is a constant. That's what's given, 2 kilograms. I, what I want to do then is arrange my equations such that the constants are on the right hand side and that would be ice. So ice is on the right but I'd like to get my variables on the left, so I'm going to rearrange and transpose the brine to the left-hand side. So now I have the equation mass of seawater minus mass of brine is equal to the constant, the mass of ice. And if you think about it, this makes sense. Take all the seawater mass, take out the mass of brine, what's left over is the mass of ice. And now this is in the same form as I would solve it for, with constants on the right. We can write equations that describe the mass balance through the system. We can always write one for total mass and that's an easiest one to write. Total mass of seawater is S minus the total mass of brine which is B and our constant in this case is 2 kilos of ice. For salt we can write that the amount of salt in the seawater is 3.5% or as a decimal point 035 times S, that's the mass of salt in the seawater, minus the mass of salt in the brine. The concentration of salt in the brine is 9%. As a decimal it's negative 0 0.09 times B and that equals the mass of salt in the ice. Well there is none so I say that's zero. Just like this we could solve for S and B because we have two independent equations with two unknowns, but I'm going to ask you on test to write all possible mass balance equations. Let's get the other one. We can write a mass balance equation for water. The total mass of water in the seawater, it's 96.5% water, that would be 0.965 
times the mass of seawater, which is our unknown S. The mass of water in the brine is 91%, so it's negative 0.91 times the mass of the brine, our other unknown. And that equals, again, the total mass of water in the ice. In this case, it's 2 kilos. This particular problem is kind of simplistic because we could take the second equation, transpose the brine, bring it over here to the right, and we could then isolate S or B. Let's say we divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.09. We'd have whatever this fraction is, 035 over 09 times S is equal to B. We could then substitute B into equation 1, and now we'll have one equation with one unknown in terms of S. We could solve for S, then substitute S in and solve for B. That's how we would do it in math class, but I'm going to do this using linear equations and matrices because other problems won't be so trivial as this and we'll need to use that method in other cases. So here's how we can do this. As I just mentioned, we could solve it algebraically, substituting equation 2 and equation 1. We could use the two-variable linear equation solver on the calculator. That's certainly the easiest route. We could solve it using matrices in Excel. And the calculator actually has a matrix solver as well. But it's rather awkward to use. There's a lot of keys to punch for something that's fairly straightforward. The only advantage to the matrix solver on the calculator that I'm aware of is that you can solve equations with up to four variables in them on the matrix solver. But if you use the linear equation solver on the calculator, it only handles a maximum of three variable linear equations. But I'll demonstrate solving matrices in Excel. And of course in Excel you can have very, very large square matrices that can be solved. There's a video already posted on Blackboard that shows how to actually enter the data into the Sharp calculator for solving linear equations. So I won't take the time to video that again. I'll just tell you the steps here, and if you're unclear, you can watch that video. So on the Sharp calculator, you'd hit the Mode button. Then you choose Equation, which is option 4. And then 2VLE, since we have two variables, and then hit the 0 key. When you press the zero key, you're presented with A1 colon. This is where you'd enter the coefficient of the variable for x, or in this case, s. Now I'm going to choose equations 1 and 2. So in this case, the coefficient is 1 on the s term. Then you hit equal sign, and then B1 colon, you would enter the coefficient of the variable b, in this case, or y, that'll be negative 1, equals, and then c1 colon, you'll enter 2, which is the constant, followed by an equal sign. Do the same for the second equation. So a2 colon would be 0 0.035, the coefficient of s, seawater. Then b2 colon, enter negative 0 0.09, equals, and then c2 colon, enter 0, and then hit equal sign. When you hit equals, you're presented with the solutions. It'll say x is 3.272727, ad infinitum. And it'll also tell you y is equal to 1.272727, and so on. So these are the values of the variables, x and y, or in our case, s and b. The order in which they're displayed is the same as the order in which you entered them. So we entered the coefficient of the s variables first and the coefficients of the b variables second. So therefore, these are the values of s and b in that order. So the answer to the problem is 3.27 kilograms of seawater and 1.27 kilograms of brine would be produced, and that would produce 2 kilograms of ice. I want to show you this now in Excel. So here's the same problem in Excel. I have the same three equations, total mass, salt, and water. I've taken the coefficient of the variables. We call it matrix A, 0 0.035, negative 0 0.09, 0 0.965, negative 0.91. To solve for the matrix, we need to multiply the inverse matrix of A times the matrix of the constants. We'll call that B. 
So to get the inverse matrix, I'm going to select four cells to begin with, then click the Insert Function button and find the equals M inverse function, and scroll over the array of the matrix whose inverse you want, and press Enter. We multiply that by the matrix of the constants. Here they are. Now in this case, you notice I've chosen the second and third equations, 0 and 2. And to get the solutions, select the cells where you want the matrix of the variables to display. Click on the Insert Function button. Find the function called mmult. You'll need to then scroll over two arrays, the inverse array first, comma, and then the matrix of the constants. And in normal algebra, order of multiplication doesn't matter, but for matrices it does. You must first enter the inverse matrix and second the matrix of the constants and hit enter and these are again the solutions. 3.27 kilograms of seawater required to produce 2 kilograms of ice. Just one last note here. When you are solving simultaneous equations, do you recall from our computer class, here are two equations. 2x minus y is 12. That's an equation of a line. x plus y is equal to 3. That's another equation of a line. When you solve for this, you're finding the point of intersection, the point where they're common. And that's it for question number 5. Problem number six tells us that 300 grams of air and 24 grams of carbon are placed in a reactor and heated to ensure complete combustion. Calculate the composition in percent by volume of the gas produced, assuming that air is 21% by volume oxygen, 79% by volume nitrogen. The first thing I would do is draw a diagram Here's my processing unit. In this case, it's a furnace. And write down all the things that you know. We have 24 grams of carbon being fed to the furnace along with 300 grams of air. And the product is a gas. I'll call it a flue gas because a flue gas is something that's emitted from a furnace. And we're asked to calculate the percent by volume now nitrogen will be present because it's present in the air and it's typically not converted under normal conditions. And we'll have the carbon being converted to carbon dioxide. And there may well be excess oxygen. Typically when combustions are carried out, oxygen is often added in excess. So there may be. Let's figure that out. We'll find out. I'm writing down the balanced equation. One mole of carbon reacts with one mole of oxygen to produce one mole of carbon dioxide. So how many moles of carbon do we have here? Well, 24 grams of carbon divided by its molar mass is two moles of carbon. So when two moles of carbon are burned, we're going to produce two moles of carbon dioxide. And that'll be part of the flue gas. One thing really important to remember is that mole percent is the same as volume percent, and that's true for gases only. How are we going to solve this? Well, the question asks for us to calculate the volume percent of the flue gas, not the mass percent. And since volume percent is the same as mole percent, I think it's easiest to stay in moles as much as possible, rather than converting everything to mass and then back to moles at the end. So I'd like to work out the number of moles of air that we have. And to do that, I need the molar mass of air. Now this is given in the beginning of this chapter in the notes, but let's do it here anyway. The volume percent of air is 79% by volume nitrogen and 21% by volume oxygen, and those are the mole percents, as we said. So considering one mole of air, you'd have 0.7 9 moles of nitrogen times its molar mass, 28.02 grams per mole, is 22.14 grams of nitrogen in a mole of air. And for oxygen, the 21% by volume is the same as 21% moles, 
6.21 moles of oxygen per mole of air times its molar mass of 32 grams per mole, 6.72 grams of oxygen in a mole of air. Add these two together, we find out the total mass in a mole of air is 28.86 grams, and therefore that's its molar mass. Now we don't need to go to weight percent um, because we're working in moles, but just because I have it right here, I went ahead and calculated it dividing the masses of the gases by the total mass gives us the weight percents which as you can see are not the same as the volume percent or the mole percent alright so now that we have the molar mass of air we calculate the number of moles 300 grams of air divided by its molar mass of 28.86 we have 10.4 moles of air from that we can figure out the number of moles of oxygen in it because it's 21 percent oxygen mole percent and so 0.21 times 10.4 is 2.18 grams of oxygen in the 300 grams of air we know that we started with two moles of carbon producing two moles of carbon dioxide now that would use two moles of oxygen and so I'm subtracting here the two moles of oxygen that will be used by the two moles of carbon. And that means we have an excess of oxygen, 0.18 moles of oxygen in excess. We also have nitrogen present, 10.4 moles of air times 0.79 mole percent nitrogen is 8.22 moles of nitrogen. And then of course we have the carbon dioxide produced, that gas, 2.0 moles. If we add up the total number of moles of the flue gas, it's 10.4 moles. Notice, interestingly, it's exactly the same as the number of moles of air that went in. Does that make sense? I think it does because each mole of oxygen that's consumed produces one mole of CO2. So really the number of moles in total hasn't changed, just the distribution of it. We're asked then to calculate the mole percent of each component, so simply divide the number of moles of oxygen and nitrogen and carbon by the total number of moles. You'll find out it's 1.73-ish moles of oxygen, 79.0 moles of nitrogen, 19.2 moles of carbon dioxide, which totals 99.93, so we're pretty close. And that should do it for question number six. Question number seven. The sulfuric acid concentration used in automobile lead acid batteries is 36.0% sulfuric acid. A tank of old, weak sulfuric acid contains 12.43% sulfuric acid. If 300 kilograms of 77.7% .7 sulfuric acid are added to the tank and the final solution concentration is 36% sulfuric which is what we want for the automobile batteries how many kilograms of battery acid has been made now if you've downloaded older notes please note that I've rewritten this problem I thought it would be more interesting if we use the actual concentration of sulfuric acid that is used in the lead acid battery rather than the values in the previous problem. So the first thing you want to do is draw a diagram. So I've drawn the processing unit. In this case it's an acid mixing tank. And we'll look at the masses coming in and the masses going out and do a mass balance evaluation. So we're told that we have 300 kilograms of a strong acid. I'll just call it capital S and it's 77.7 percent .7 by weight sulfuric. From that we can calculate the actual mass of sulfuric acid delivered by that stream. The balance must be water, so that's 22.3 percent water. 22.3 percent of 300 kilograms is 66.9 kilograms of water. This will wind up being our constants in the calculations. We also have a waste acid going in. We don't know how much we want to calculate that we are given its composition as 12.43 percent sulfuric acid and the balance therefore must be water which is then 87.57 percent water these two streams mix we form our battery acid 
We don't know how much. We'd like to know. And its composition will be 36% sulfuric, and the balance, therefore, must be water at 64%. So I wrote a basic equation, mass in equals mass out. What's the mass going in? In a general sense, it's the strong acid plus the mass of the weak acid combined makes the mass of the battery acid. We can now write a mass equation for each component in the system. We can write one for the total mass. We'll say the total mass of strong acid is 300 kilograms plus the total mass of weak acid. We don't know. We'll just call it capital W. And that'll equal the total mass of the battery acid. Again, we don't know what it is. We'll give it a, a variable name of B. We can likewise write a mass equation for the sulfuric acid in the system. The amount of sulfuric acid in the 300 kilograms of strong acid is, we worked out up here, 233.1 kilograms. The amount of sulfuric acid in the weak acid is, well, it's 0.1243 times the weight of the weak acid. And the amount of sulfuric acid in the battery acids will be 36% of whatever the mass of battery acid is. Likewise, for the water mass balance, we can say that 66.9 kilograms of water was delivered by the strong acid. And the weak acid contains water. 87.57 fraction of the mass of weak acid would be water, given here. And then for the battery acid, 64% of the battery acid is water, so 0.64 times B. So we have three mass balance equations. So when I look at these equations, I would like them to be in standard form. For example, A1x plus B1y is constant 1. A2x plus B2y is constant 2. So I'd like to get my constants on one side of the equation and my variables together on the other side. So to do that, I'm going to transpose. I'll bring the weak acid terms to the right, and I'll have my constant on the left. So in a general sense, I'll have uh, battery acid minus weak acid must be strong acid. If you think about it, that has to make sense. The battery acid is the combination of weak acid and strong acid, so battery acid minus weak acid must be strong acid. All right, so for the first equation, we'd have B minus W equals 300. For the second equation, we'd have 0.36B minus 0.1243W will be equal to 233.1. The third equation, we'd have 0.64B minus 0.8757W will be equal to 66.9. Now it's simply a matter of putting them in the linear equation solver on your calculator. So mode equation 4, two variable linear equation 0. A1, I'm going to choose the first two equations. A1 will be this coefficient here, 1. B1 will be negative 1. And constant 1 is 300. A2, 0.36. B2 is negative 0.1243. And C2 is 233.1. When you press the last equal sign, you get 831 for x and 531 for y. And the order in which these display is the same order that you entered them. We entered the mass of battery acid first, and then the weak acid. So this is the mass of battery acid, 831 kilograms, and 531 kilograms of weak acid. Now, it's not a bad idea to check your result when you're done. In fact, it's a very good idea to check your result when you're done. So here's what I did. I just figured, OK, the total mass of sulfuric acid going in should be the total mass of sulfuric acid going out. And if my numbers are correct, these two sides should be equal. So I took the mass of strong acid times the fraction, which is sulfuric acid. That's 233.1 kilograms of sulfuric acid, plus the mass of the weak acid we calculated times the fraction of sulfuric acid in it. 0.1243 gives you the mass of sulfuric acid in the weak acid stream at 66 kilograms. That sum is 299.1, and that should equal the mass of the battery acid, 831 kilograms that was generated by the solver, times its fraction, 
0.36 and that's 299.2 kilograms and that's close enough to assure us that the answer is correct. Question 9 is next. I won't review question 8 because it's a simple separation by distillation and there were several examples studied in the first video. It's the same. Question 9 says a slurry containing 25 percent solids is fed to a filter and after filtration the filter cake contains 90 percent solids and the filtrate contains 1 percent solids. Calculate the flow rates of the cake and the filtrate assuming a slurry feed rate of 2,000 kilograms per hour. So again I start by drawing a diagram of the process. Here's my vacuum filter that will separate solids and liquids out of a slurry. We have a flow rate of 2,000 kilograms per hour of slurry, that's our feed. We're given the composition, it's 25 percent solids and 0.25 times 2,000 is 500 kilograms per hour of solids. That means there must be 75 percent liquid in the slurry. 0.75 of 2,000 is 1,500 kilograms per hour of liquid. These will be our constant values. Coming out of the unit we have the cake and the filtrate. We want to calculate the flow rates of each and the composition is 90 percent solids in the cake which means that 10 percent must be liquid and then the filtrate is 1 percent solid so there's 99 percent liquid in it. Simple calculation, mass out equals mass in. So for the total mass, we can say the total mass of cake plus the total mass of filtrate must be 2,000 kilograms per hour. Now for each component, the solid mass in the cake is 90% of the cake mass and the solid component of the filtrate is 1% of the filtrate and all in total that must equal 500 kilograms per hour because that's the amount of solids that went into the system. For the liquids we can write that the 10% of the cake is a liquid and 99% of the filtrate is a liquid and the total mass of liquid we determined was 1500 kilograms per hour of liquid. They must be equal so very simply on the calculator I used equation 1 and equation 2 so for A1 I used the coefficient of C which is 1 B1 the coefficient of the filtrate F which is 1 and the constant 1 is 2000 in the second equation the coefficient of C is 0.9 that will be A2 B2 is the coefficient of the filtrate 0 0.01 and C2 is the constant here for the solids 500. Pressing equals gives me that X which corresponds to the mass flow rate of the cake is 539 kilograms per hour and Y which is the mass flow rate of the filtrate is 1461 kilograms per hour. And as a check I write out the first equation, C plus F is 2000. I substitute my values for C and F in, and in fact both sides are equal. So it looks good. Problem number 10. Natural gas consisting of 95% methane and 5% nitrogen by volume is burned in a furnace with 15 percent excess air. What volume of air at 289 Kelvin and 101.3 kilopascals is required if the fuel feed rate is 10 cubic meters per second at the same temperature and pressure? Then determine the quantity in kilograms of all the components of the flue gas produced. Notice the temperature is not standard temperature. It's not at 273, although the pressure is standard pressure, one atmosphere. Let's draw a diagram to start. Here's our furnace. Natural gas is being fed at a flow rate of 10 cubic meters per second. 
at 289 Kelvin and 1 atmosphere. The composition is 95% methane. That means there will be 9.5 cubic meters per second of methane and 5% nitrogen, so 0.5 cubic meters per second of nitrogen. The air, well, it's also at 289 Kelvin and 1 atmosphere. It's being fed in 15% excess over what is stoichiometrically required by the natural gas. Now we have flue gases produced. We're asked to calculate the mass flow, kilograms per second, of all the components. Let's start with the balanced equation. One mole of methane reacts with two moles of oxygen, producing one mole of CO2 and two moles of water. Now recall that for gases, mole ratios and volume ratios are the same. One mole of methane occupies 22.4 liters at STP. Two moles of any gas, oxygen, will occupy 44.8 liters of STP. So we can make mole ratios from the balanced equation, but we can also make volume ratios from the balanced equation as long as the gases we're working with are at the same temperature and pressure, not even necessarily at STP. The ratios are consistent at any temperature or any pressure, provided it's the same temperature and pressure in both cases. Now, the units for this question are in kilograms and cubic meters, and those are engineering units rather than laboratory units. So in the lab we like to talk about um, one mole occupies 22.4 liters of a gas, but it's also true if you multiply by a thousand that a kilomole occupies 22.4 cubic meters of a gas. Similarly, for molar mass in the lab we like to use grams per mole, but it's also true, multiplying by a factor of a thousand, that the molar mass can be reported as kilograms per kilomole. And we're going to use this engineering notation because it actually simplifies the calculations even though it may seem unfamiliar to us. I want to start by calculating the volume of oxygen and air that's needed to burn the 9.5 cubic meters of methane. And from the balanced equation there's twice as many liters or cubic meters of oxygen required for every cubic meter of methane. So simply a ratio of 2 over 1, the volume ratio, tells us that there will be 19.0 cubic meters of oxygen stoichiometrically required. Now we add 15% excess, so I'm multiplying by 1.15. So in fact what's been added is 21.85 cubic meters of oxygen. So how much air is that? Well, the ratio of oxygen in air is the ratio of 1 to 0.21. Oxygen represents 21% of the volume of air. So dividing by 0.21 gives us 104.0 cubic meters of air has been added. So that's the total volume of air that's been added. Now let's break it down, the mass of each component that's present in the flue gas. From the natural gas, 5% was nitrogen, and there was 10 cubic meters of gas, so that's 0.5 cubic meters of nitrogen, but it was at 289 Kelvin. Let's convert that to standard temperature, so we can convert then to moles, and then ultimately to kilograms. So you don't want to use PV equals NRT here. You don't need to make it complicated. It's very simple. Think about it with me. When the Kelvin temperature of a gas decreases, say by a factor of two, then the volume will decrease by a factor of two. In this case, the Kelvin temperature is decreasing by this factor, 273 over 289, or vice versa, 289 over 273. That's the ratio of temperature decrease that will also be the ratio of volume decrease. The volume gets smaller, put the small number over the big number. 0.5 cubic meters of nitrogen at 289 Kelvin occupies 0.472 cubic meters at 273 Kelvin, and that's at one atmosphere pressure, so now we can say it's at STP. We have 104 cubic meters of air that's been added, again at 289 Kelvin. 
what volume would that be at 273? It would be less by the ratio of the Kelvin temperatures. That's 98.24 cubic meters of air. How much of the air is nitrogen? We multiply by 0.79 because air is 79 volume percent nitrogen. So we have 77.6 cubic meters of nitrogen and that's at STP. If I add the two volumes of nitrogen at STP, 78.07 cubic meters of nitrogen. We can now convert from cubic meters to kilograms. So one mole of any gas occupies 22.41 liters at STP and similarly one kilomole of any gas occupies 22.41 cubic meters at STP. So we can convert 78.07 cubic meters of nitrogen to kilomoles of nitrogen. And recall that 28.02 grams of nitrogen is one mole of nitrogen and similarly 28.02 kilograms of nitrogen is one kilomole of nitrogen. This will then give us the kilograms of nitrogen present in the flue gas 97.6. Let's consider carbon dioxide next. From the balanced equation one mole of methane produces one mole of CO2. And since they're both gases we can also say that a cubic meter of methane will produce a cubic meter of CO2 provided they're at the same temperature and pressure. So there's 9.5 cubic meters of methane in the natural gas being burned, but that's at 289 Kelvin. What volume is that at 273 Kelvin? It'll be less by the same factor as the Kelvin temperature changes times 273 over 289. That'll be 8.97 cubic meters of methane which will be the same volume of CO2, 8.97 cubic meters of CO2. But now we're at STP, 273 Kelvin, and we were already at one atmosphere pressure. Let's convert the volume of CO2 at STP to the mass of CO2. So one kilomole per 22.41 cubic meters. So dividing this by 22.41, we have 0 0.400 kilomoles of CO2 times its molar mass, 44 kilograms per kilomole, is 17.6 kilograms of CO2. Let's calculate the mass of water present. From the balanced equation, one mole of methane produces two moles of water. We already determined that there's 8.97 cubic meters of methane at STP coming from the natural gas. Let's convert that volume to kilomoles. So one kilomole per 22.41 cubic meters at STP. So 8.97 divided by 22.41 is 0.4 kilomoles of methane, the same as we had up here. Now moles of water, there's two kilomoles of water for every kilomole of methane, so multiply by two and that's 0.801 kilomoles of water. Times its molar mass of 18.015 kilograms per kilomole is 14.4 kilograms of water. Now at STP that'll be present as a liquid. It wouldn't be in the flue gas, but it is part of the product, so I've calculated it as well. And finally for oxygen, recall that one mole of methane is burned with two moles of oxygen, but we added a 15% excess. So what will remain is the 15% excess. So we start with 8.97 cubic meters of methane at STP. How many cubic meters of oxygen would be required? Well, twice that. So there's two cubic meters of oxygen for every cubic meter of methane, or I could say two moles of oxygen for every mole of methane. Recall that volume percent and mole percent are the same for gases. So the 17.94 cubic meters of oxygen will be converted to water. It's only the 15% excess of this that will remain as oxygen. So that 15% excess is times 0.15 or 2.69 cubic meters of oxygen. We want to then convert this to kilomoles and then to kilograms. 
So there are 32 kilograms per kilomole, and a kilomole is 22.41 cubic meters, so I just condensed this calculation a little bit. That gives us 3.84 kilograms of oxygen. So those are all the components in the product. Tedious for sure. Problem 11 is another easy problem. Vinegar with a strength of 4.63% by weight acetic acid is pumped into a vat to which 1,000 kilograms of 36% by weight acetic acid is added. The resulting mixture contains 8.5% by weight acid. How much of this 8.5% acid solution is in the vat? We start by drawing a processing unit. I'll call it the mixing vat. We have two streams going in. We have vinegar, which I'm calling V for the variable and it's 4.63 percent acetic acid and therefore the balance is water 95.37 percent we don't know the mass but we'll have to figure that out we're also adding a thousand kilograms of a strong acid the strong acid is 36 percent by weight acetic acid and therefore it's 64 percent by weight water now since we know the total mass we can figure out the mass of each component 0.36 times 1,000 is 360 kilograms of acetic acid and 640 kilograms of water. These will represent our constants in the equations. The weak acid coming out, we don't know how much there is, but it is 8.5% acetic acid and 91.5% water. We can write our mass balance equation, mass in equals mass out. So I'm going to say the strong acid which is given here, plus the vinegar up here will be equal to the total mass of weak acid over here. So I'm using S for strong acid, V for vinegar, W for acid. Let's write an equation for each component. First of all, for the total mass for the system, we know there's a thousand kilograms of the strong acid that was given here, that's a constant, plus the mass of vinegar, which we don't know, we'll call it V and that must equal the weight of the total weak acid which we'll use the variable W for. For the amount of acetic acid in the system, what's the mass of acetic acid in the strong acid? Well, we work that out as 360 kilograms. What's the mass of acetic acid in the vinegar? We don't know, but we know that it's 4.63 percent of the mass of vinegar, so 0 0.0463 times V. What's the mass of acetic acid in the weak acid? Well, again, we don't know, but we know it's 8.5% of the mass of this weak acid. So 0 0.085 times W, where W is the mass of the weak acid. We can also write a mass balance equation for water through the process. The amount of water in the strong acid we worked out is 640 kilograms of water. Plus the amount of water in the vinegar well, that's 95.37% of whatever the mass of vinegar is, so 0.9537 times V. Those two together must equal the total mass in the weak acid, which is 91.5%, or 0.915 times W. Now, once again, I'd like to arrange these in the standard form. We have uh, the coefficients on the left and the constant on the right, or at least coefficients together on one side and the constant on the other. What I'm going to do here is simply leave the constants on the left and just transpose the variable V in each case. So we have for total mass 1000 equals W minus V. For acetic acid mass we'll have 360 equals 0 0.085 minus 0 0.0463 times V. And for the water mass, we'll have 640 equals 0.915 W minus 0.9537 V. I'm taking the first two equations in the solver, so I'll enter A1 as 1 right here. That's the coefficient of W. And the coefficient of V, negative 1, I'll use for B1. And C1, the constant, is 1,000. From the second equation, a2 will be equal to 0 0.085, the coefficient of W. B2 will be negative 0 0.0463, the 
the coefficient of v and c2 will be 360 that's our second constant when I hit equals the solver tells me that x which corresponds to the first variable entered the weak acid is 8106 kilograms of weak acid and it tells us that y which corresponds to the second variable entered is 7106 kilograms of vinegar and as a check I plug these values into the first equation the first equation is 1000 equals w minus v so 1000 is equal to 8106 minus 7106 for v 1000 equals 1000 so a pretty good sense that this problem is correct Problem 13 is a very straightforward problem. Limestone is fed to a rotary kiln at a rate of 4,000 kilograms per hour. A kiln is basically a high temperature furnace used for decomposition of industrial materials like limestone. Heat is supplied by hot gases which sweep through the kiln. Limestone is composed of 94.52% calcium carbonate 4.16% magnesium carbonate and 1.32% inerts. It's a very typical composition of good quality limestone and the inerts generally include things like silica and aluminosilicates and clays which are by and large unconverted in the furnace. Assuming a 100% conversion of carbonates to oxides calculate the rate of production of lime. That would be the oxides and the inerts together and the percentage composition of the lime. So I've drawn a picture of a kiln. Limestone feed rate is 4,000 kilograms per hour at this composition. That's the mass in. The mass out is carbon dioxide gas plus the lime that's produced. We're not told the mass flow rate were asked to calculate it and also asked to calculate the composition in percent. I've written here the equations for the decomposition of calcium carbonate to calcium oxide and CO2 and the molar masses of calcium carbonate and calcium oxide and here is the equation for the decomposition of magnesium carbonate to magnesium oxide and their relative molecular weights. So very simply for each component, calcium carbonate in the limestone is 94.52%, so 0.9452 times the total mass of limestone gives us the total mass of calcium carbonate feed in the limestone. Then this ratio of molecular weights that converts the mass of calcium carbonate to the mass of lime, calcium oxide, 2118 kilograms of calcium oxide. For magnesium carbonate, it's 4.16% of the total, so 0.416 times 4,000 will give you the kilograms per hour of magnesium carbonate. Then converting that from magnesium carbonate to magnesium oxide using the ratio of molecular weights gives us 79.5 kilograms per hour of magnesium oxide. The inerts are 0.0132 or 1.32% times 4,000. Since they don't convert, we just use that mass directly. 52.8 kilograms of inerts. The sum of the masses of these three components is 2251 kilograms of solids and that's the lime in total. The composition would be obtained by dividing the mass of each component by the total mass and multiplying by 100 to give us 94.1 percent calcium oxide and then 3.53 percent by weight magnesium oxide and then 2.35 percent by weight inerts. Problem 14 is easier than it looks. We just have to break it down a bit. Draw a diagram and set up equations representing the total mass balance and the component mass balance for a system involving the mixing of pork, which is 15 percent protein, 20 percent fat, and 65 percent water, and back fat, which is 10 percent water, 80 percent fat, and 10 percent protein making 100 kilograms of a mixture that is 25 percent fat. Here's a diagram of a meat grinder where the pork and the back fat are mixed together to make the mixture. 
pork is 15% protein, 20% fat, 65% water, but we don't know how much pork is fed in. The back fat is 10% protein, 80% fat, and 10% water, but we don't know the amount of back fat fed in. The mixture is 100 kilograms of mixture. That will give us a constant. And we are told that it's 25% fat. We need to calculate the percent protein as well as percent water. How do you start? Write an equation, mass in equals mass out. So as a first equation I can say all of the pork plus all the back fat is equal to all of the mixture which is 100 kilograms. Now the fat composition, we can work that out. The fat composition is 20% of the pork and it's 80% of the back fat and the total fat is 25 kilos. So we do have two equations with two unknowns. We'll solve them. In the solver I let A1 equal 1, the coefficient of the pork. B1 is 1, the coefficient of the back fat, and the constant is 100. The second equation A2 is 0.2, B2 is 0.8, and the constant, second constant is 25. The solution given is X, which is the mass of pork, is 91.67 kilograms, and Y, which is the mass of back fat, is 8.33 kilograms. As a check, we can substitute these two masses into equation 1. Pork plus back fat must equal 100, and in fact it does. Now that we have the mass of pork and the mass of back fat, it'll be easy to calculate the mass of protein and water in each component. So for protein, it represents 15% of the pork, so 15.15 times 91.67 kilograms of pork. It represents 10% or 0.1 times the mass of the back fat, 8.33, for a total of 14.6 kilograms of protein. And for water, water represents 65% of the pork, 0.65 times 91.67. And water represents 10% of the back fat, so 0.1 times 8.33 kilograms of back fat, for a total of 60.4 kilograms of water. And for the fat, we already know it's 25 kilos. Add those all together, it adds up to 100 kilograms total as we were told, and so therefore these masses are also the percent masses. Pretty straightforward. Problem number 15. Much more difficult than some of the other ones. So a producer gas is made from coke Coke is basically pyrolyzed coal, so it's essentially pure carbon. It has the following composition by volume. 28% carbon monoxide, 3.5% carbon dioxide, 0.5% oxygen, 68% nitrogen by volume. Now this gas is burned. So we're talking about the gas as a fuel. This is being burned. Coke is not in this problem. It's simply telling you the history of it. So the, the producer gas is what's being burned with such a quantity of air that the oxygen from the air is 20 percent in excess of the net oxygen required for complete combustion. So what in here is burning and requires oxygen? Nitrogen doesn't burn. Oxygen is a an oxidizer, not a fuel. Carbon dioxide is fully oxidized. It's only the carbon monoxide that will burn. So it's being burned with such a quantity of air that the oxygen in the air is 20 percent in excess of the net oxygen required for complete combustion. And it's commonly done this way. We often add an excess. Now what do we mean by net oxygen required? We'll get to that. Now the combustion is only 98 percent complete. Calculate the mass and composition percent by volume of the combustion gas formed per one mole of gas burned. 
Well, let's start with a diagram. So here we have a furnace where the combustion is taking place. Our fuel is the producer gas. One mole is being burned. Its composition is shown here. And so based on one mole, these are the number of moles of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen that are present in the fuel gas. And then we have air that's being added in 20% excess of what's net required. And here's the composition of air. And our product is a combustion gas whose mass and percent composition we're asked to calculate per mole of producer gas burned. Let's start with the balanced equation. Carbon monoxide is the fuel. Two moles of carbon monoxide react with one mole of oxygen to produce two moles of CO2. We'll have to keep in mind that this reaction only goes 98% to completion. That is, some of the carbon monoxide, 2%, will remain unburned. Well, let's start with the carbon monoxide. So 0.28 moles of carbon monoxide, which is what's present in one mole of producer gas, since it's 28% carbon monoxide, we have 0.28 moles of carbon monoxide. It's 98% burned, 98% complete. So 98% of that is 0.2744 moles of carbon monoxide actually burned, and therefore 0.2744 moles of carbon dioxide is produced. Now there was also some carbon dioxide originally present, if you recall. 3.5% carbon dioxide, that's 035 moles of carbon dioxide. If we add what was originally present to what was produced, we find out that the total quantity of carbon dioxide in the combustion gas is 0 0.3094 moles of CO2. So we have one of our terms solved for. Now, we were told that the carbon monoxide was only 98% burned, which means 2% did not burn. That 2% of 0 0.28 represents 0056 moles of carbon monoxide, and that will also remain in the combustion gas. There's a second term solved for. Now we have to figure out the amount of oxygen and the amount of nitrogen. The oxygen's a bit tricky. So we let's read this again. The gas is burned with such a quantity of air that the oxygen from the air is 20% in excess of the net oxygen required for complete combustion and the combustion is 98 percent. Okay, so we had 0.28 moles of carbon monoxide that would stoichiometrically require half as many moles of oxygen, 0.14, from the balanced equation, right? One mole of oxygen burns two moles of carbon monoxide. That's the stoichiometric requirement. But what's the net requirement? Well, because we already had some oxygen present, recall, look at the producer gas. It already contains 0 0.005 moles of oxygen. So the net requirement is the 0.14 minus what we already have. The net requirement is 0.135 moles of oxygen. Now we're told that we add oxygen such that it's 20% in excess of what the net requirement is. So 20% more than 0.135 is 0.162 moles of oxygen will be added from the air. So how much oxygen will we actually have present? Well, we just said we're going to add 0.162 moles of oxygen from the air. And don't forget, we uh, still have the excess 0 0.005 moles that was originally present. In total, then, we have 0.167 moles of oxygen present. Now, how much of that will be burned? How much remains? Recall that 0.2744 moles of carbon monoxide were burned. We got that up here. Remember, 98% of the 0.28 moles was burned. So if 0.2744 moles were burned, that means we would use half as many moles of oxygen divided by 2. 0.1372 moles of oxygen were actually burned. If I subtract that amount of oxygen consumed 
from what we had present, then the difference is 0.298 moles of oxygen remain. And that's our third component in the combustion gas. And now finally the nitrogen, not quite so difficult. We determined that we added 0.162 moles of oxygen added right up here. And when we add oxygen we're also adding nitrogen in a ratio of 79 over 21. So that ratio times 162 means we added 0.6094 moles of nitrogen. But recall we also had nitrogen in the original combustion gas. If you look back up to the corner here, each mole of producer gas had 0.68 moles of nitrogen. So the total amount of nitrogen present therefore was these two added is 1.2894 moles of nitrogen remaining. So those are all the four components in the combustion product gas. So I've listed them over here. We have 1.2894 moles of nitrogen remaining, 0.3094 moles of carbon dioxide, 0.0298 moles of oxygen remain, and 0056 moles of carbon monoxide. Totaling those, the total moles of gas is 1.6342 moles. Dividing each of these moles by the total moles gives us the mole percentages. I won't read them, they're right here. Now we're also asked to calculate the masses of each. That's pretty easy. We know the number of moles of each multiplied by the molar mass. For example, 1.2894 moles of nitrogen times 28.02 grams per mole of nitrogen. We have 36.13 grams of nitrogen. And it's the same for each of the four gases, giving us the mass of each. Now if we needed to, we could add these up and find the total mass and the mass percentages which would be different than the mole percentages, but we're not asked to in this problem, but we could. So that's it, and it's, I know it's tricksy, but it's a good problem. Question 16 is an interesting problem. A liquid mixture containing 45% by weight benzene, 55% by weight toluene, is fed to a distillation column operating at steady state. Just means it's a stable process. And generally what that means is the feed is fed to the position in the column where the temperature in the column is the same as the temperature in the feed, so it doesn't upset it. However, irrelevant to our question here. Products streams emerge from the distillate, that's the top, and the underflow, that's the bottom of the column. Now the distillate contains 95% by weight benzene. I wrote that here, 95% by weight benzene. And so that means that the distillate also contains 5% toluene. Now the underflow contains 8% of the benzene fed to the column. That's interesting. So not of the underflow, but 8% of the feed fed to the column. The volumetric flow rate of the feed is 2,000 liters per hour. I have that here, 2,000 liters per hour and the specific gravity of the feed is 0.872. And notice that we're be working in mass flow rates and we're given a volumetric flow rate. We'll have to convert, but we can do it because we have the density. Determine the mass flow rate in the distillate and on and on and on. Let's, let's, let's go through this. Let's take it apart piece at a time. First of all, get the information that's easy to get. Look at the feed. We're given 2,000 liters per hour. We're told the specific gravity is 0.872. If I were to put units to specific gravity, the mass density would mean 0.872 grams per milliliter. Or, multiplying by 1,000 in the numerator and denominator, it's the same as 0.872 kilograms per liter. So we can use a specific gravity, or density, to convert from volumetric flow rate to mass flow rate, 0.872 kilograms per liter times liters per hour gives us kilograms per hour, and a 1744 is the feed rate in mass flow rate. Now we can use our percentages, 0.45, that is 45% of the feed is benzene, so 1744 times 0.45 is 785 kilograms per hour benzene. 
and 55 percent is toluene, so 1744 kilograms per hour times 0 0.55 is 955 kilograms per hour of toluene. Before I go too much farther, let's write out a mass balance equation. And let's say mass out equals mass in. So the mass out will be the distillate and the underflow, and the mass in, of course, is the feed. So we can write an equation for the total mass across the system. All the mass of the distillate plus all the mass of the underflow equals the total feed, which we determined was 1744 kilograms per hour. Now we can write a mass equation for benzene. Recall that the distillate it was 95 percent benzene. I'll just look up here for a sec. There it is, 95 percent benzene, so 0.95 times D. Now for the underflow, hmm, we don't really have a value, but we can get one because we're told that the benzene is 8 percent of the benzene feed to the column, and we have that over here at 785 kilograms per hour of benzene, and 8 percent of that is 62.8 kilograms per hour benzene. That's going to make it really nice down here. So instead of putting in a fraction times the underflow, we know the actual mass of benzene in the underflow. It's 62.8 plus the mass of benzene in the feed. So we have here, well, combine these together. 0.95 times the D is 722. So the distillate flow rate is 760 kilograms per hour. That was kind of handy. We can go back up to the distillate now and plug that in. So 95% of 760 is 760 times 0.95, or 722 kilograms of benzene in the distillate. And 5% of 760 is 760 times 0.05, or 38 kilograms per hour of toluene. Now if I add these two together, the total distillate flow rate is 760 kilograms per hour. And that just confirms what we calculated down here. 760 kilograms per hour. Let's go back to our problem and see what else they're asking for. So A was determined the mass flow rate of the distillate. We just did that, 760 kilograms per hour. The mass flow rate of benzene and toluene in the underflow. We have the benzene, we should get the toluene next. So we know that the total feed is 1744 kilograms per hour, and we just determined that the distillate is 760 kilograms per hour. The difference then must be the underflow flow rate of 984 kilograms per hour. And so we already know the benzene flow rate in the underflow. If we subtract that from the total underflow, that'll give us the toluene flow rate in the underflow, 921 kilograms per hour. Let's go back to the question and see what else they're asking for. calculate the mass fraction of benzene in the underflow. All right, let's take a look at the underflow. So the mass fraction of benzene would be the flow rate of benzene, 62.8, divided by the flow rate of the underflow, 984. That ratio is 0 0.0638. Let's go back to the question. D, calculate the ratio, the kilograms of distillate to kilograms of feed, that would be per hour flow rate. So here it is here. The distillate flow rate we said was 760 kilograms per hour, and the feed was 1744. So that ratio is simply 0.436. Now I just want to think of it as the inverse for a minute. What's the ratio of feed to distillate? Well, it's the 1744 over 760, 2.3 times. So basically you're saying that you have to feed 2.3 times faster than the product is taken off at the top of the column. And that leads us to the last problem. We're asked to calculate the mass feed rate in pounds mass per day needed to produce 2,500 pounds mass per day of distillate. So the mass feed rate to produce 2,500 pounds per day of distillate. And you look at that and you think, well, we're working in kilograms per hour. Do we have to convert 
to pounds per day? Well, no, not really, because this is just a ratio, right? We could just as easily have said kilograms per hour feed rate to produce 2,500 kilograms per hour. It's simply a ratio, and we have that ratio already. That ratio is 2.3 times. So if our 2,500 pounds per day or kilograms per hour is the distillate rate multiply by 2.3 times and that tells us that the feed rate would be 2.3 times as much 5738 pounds per day of feed and that's it this last problem number 18 is a it's a tricky problem it's a lot harder than it sounds strawberries contain about 15% by weight solids and we'll assume them to be sugar and 85 percent by weight water. To make strawberry jam crushed strawberries and sugar are mixed in a 45 to 55 mass ratio. The mixture is then heated to evaporate water until the residue contains one-third water by mass. So draw a flow chart calculate how many pounds of strawberries and sugar are needed to make a pound of jam and calculate how much water is evaporated. So let's start with the diagram. I'll call it a cooker. We're putting sugar in. We'll call that process fluid S for sugar. And it's 100 percent sugar. We're putting strawberries into the cooker and I'll use STB for the variable symbol. It's 15 percent sugar and 85 percent water. And we're given this ratio of strawberries to sugar, 45 to 55 mass ratio. So that's the mass going in. The mass coming out is, of course, water, which I'll call W, and then jam. Now, the jam is 67% by weight sugar and 33% by weight water. And we're told we want to make a pound of it. That'll be our constant. So let's start writing some equations. So we can say the mass in is sugar plus strawberries. The mass out is water plus jam. Let's try and write an equation for the total mass across the system. Well, that would simply be all the sugar plus all the strawberries equals the mass of water plus the pound of jam. Makes sense. How about the sugar distribution across the system? Well, in the sugar stream, it's 100% sugar, so that would be just S. In the strawberries, it's 15% sugar, so 0.15 times strawberries. In the water stream, there is no sugar, that's zero. And in the jam, it's 67% sugar, so 0.67 times the one pound is 0.67 pounds of sugar. We could write an equation for the water stream. There's no water in the sugar, that's zero. 0.85 times the strawberry, because there's 85% of the strawberries is water and all of the water is water so just W for that and then the percentage of water in the jam is 0.33 so it looks like we have three equations and three unknowns so we see if we can solve it we use the three variable linear equation solver in this case and I have took the coefficients a1 is equal to 1 b1 is equal to 1 c1 will be negative 1 when we transpose it and d1 is equal to 1 for the second equation, we have A2 is equal to 1, B2 is equal to 0.15, C2 would be equal to negative 0, which is just 0, and then D2 would be 0.67. For the third equation, we have A3 is equal to 0, B3 is equal to 0.85, C3 would be negative 1 when we transpose the W, and D3 would be 0.33. So you go ahead and solve this, or try to, and you get an error message. So why the error message? Well, there's only two components, sugar and water, but we have three variables. We can't get enough information from those two components to solve this. If you think about it, there are many possible ratios in which sugar and strawberries could be combined to give you the same jam composition, 67% sugar, 33% water. For instance, you could add less sugar and boil off more water. So there just isn't enough information 
based on these three equations. We need another independent equation that fixes the ratio of components, and we were given that. We were told that the ratio of strawberries to sugar mass ratio was 45 to 55. And we can rearrange this equation to get another independent equation. So here I've written the ratio of strawberries to sugar is equal to 0.45 over 0.55. I could have written 45 over 55, but, but it makes the number smaller this way. I'm now going to cross multiply. I'll have 0.55 times strawberry mass equals 0.45 times sugar mass. And I'm going to combine this new equation with equation 2 back up here. S amount of sugar in the sugar is 100% plus 15% of the strawberries, 0.15 equals 0.67. And our new equation, 0.45 times the mass of sugar minus, I'm transposing the strawberries to the right hand side, minus 0.55 times the mass of strawberries is equal to then 0. I'd have 0 on the left hand side. I now have two equations that are independent with just two unknowns. Let's give it a try. So in the 2VLE solver, A1 is the coefficient of S is 1, B1 is 0.15, C1 is our constant from the first equation, A2 is the coefficient of S in the next equation, B2 negative 0.055 and C2 is 0. And we, when we press equal, and when we press equals, we get a solution, x, which is the mass of sugar, is 0.5968 pounds, and y, the mass of strawberries, is 0.4883 pounds. That's the total mass of sugar and strawberries combined to make a pound of jam. And that mass is 1.0851 pounds, total mass. If we then subtract the mass of jam that was actually obtained, the difference must be water, so 0 0.085 pounds of water was evaporated. And just as a check, I have the ratio of sugar to strawberries that we calculated here is 0 0.5968 to 0.4883. That ratio is 1.222. And the ratio given to us, sugar to strawberries, was 55 over 45, or 1.222. So I'm pretty confident this is correct. And that's the end of the material balance problems for CHM 507.